listening? God is always listening. He always hears. He's always there. Even though sometimes it doesn't feel like it, he, He's always there. He always hears. Amen. I almost feel like changing my message tonight, but I, don't think, I just got this one about two hours ago, too. It, I thought that they, they switched up on me, and God switched up on me early. I said, well, but uh, anyway, uh, we're thankful that we know a God who's greater than, he's a name above every name. I, uh, <clears throat> Sunday night, I preached a message, uh, for those of you who were here, about um, things happening in our nation. <clears throat> and it, the launch point of it was, not, not, it wasn't the sole uh, topic, but the launch point of it was, in New York State, they passed the gay marriage thing, you know. And I, I asked John to video it, and I'm asking him to video this one tonight, because we don't usually video the nighttime ones. But I had said that, and I started out the message, and I always do this. Whenever we deal with something like that, I always say this. You know what? I don't hate anybody. I don't. Some of you know me well enough. I don't, I don't hate anybody. <laughs> You know, I just, there's, there's some folks I might not like, you know, <laughs> for whatever reason or another. You always got some folks you don't like, you know, let's face it. You just, we're humans, we don't get along with everybody. But I, I put the message on uh, YouTube, and I, I named it, if you remember, we started in Isaiah chapter 5, those that call evil good and good evil. And that was like the title, and I started getting comments you know, if you ever look at YouTube, they put comments on me. And I got, hate, you're, you, you hate, you, you know. And I wrote them back and I said, if you listen to the first two minutes of the message, I don't hate anybody. And if, and if you would listen to the message, you know, that's not the only sin. <laughs> I talked about our nation and how, just how our, our society and culture is so morally bankrupt, not just in that area, but in every area. And uh, tonight, I, I was going to do a, another message because we had been talking about Abraham and faith. So I was going to do a message about faith. And about two hours ago, I just started getting some other stuff. All right. So you're, you know, you'll know, you have to forgive me if it seems a little disjointed tonight. But I, uh, Rose and I, I want to talk tonight about light. Okay? Light. Light. Enlightenment. We've heard that word, enlightenment. When Rose and I, we were, last week we were away at, our, uh, at the camp meeting. And uh, we were in the hotel room and I was changing clothes. And I, I have this pair of brown corduroy pants that I love. I probably wear them, some of you probably know which ones I'm talking about. I wear them like probably eight times a week. I just, I, I wear them all the time. They're comfortable, they fit good. And so I was going to change, right? So I, 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 put, I, put, I got dressed, and I got those pants, I had those pants, and I got the, to, to take the belt off. And I, I lifted them up like this to take the belt off, and the, I was in front of the window, and I looked, and there was light coming through them. <laughs> I could see through them. And I said, man, I didn't know they was that wore out. <laughs> so I said, Rose, you know, I said, there's light coming through. <laughs> she said, maybe you better throw them away. I said, light reveals things, doesn't it? If you hold something up to the light, it'll show you where, the, where there's holes in it. And um, anyway, we want to show the light a little bit tonight. We're coming up to uh, our nation's birthday, the 4th of July. And some of you have heard me preach this, and you kind of know where I stand. And, and sometimes when I say some of this stuff, sometimes people get mad at me. But that's okay. Just as long as you don't hate me. You can get mad at me all you want. That you won't be the first, you won't be the last. But we have been inundated with uh, preaching and teaching from people that want us to believe, that, that will try to convince us that the United States of America was formulated to be a Christian nation. Now, we have a Christian history. That's, un, that's undeniable because the early uh, settlers, especially those who settled to the north, New England, the, the Puritans, they came and their stated purpose was to evangelize 
the native peoples of this nation. The other ones, they said they wanted to evangelize them too, but then they went and they took their land because they had guns. <laughs> they had better weapons, you know. But the, 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 we have a Christian history. The, 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 the founders were originally had a Christian background, Church of England or the, uh, the Puritans and so forth. But when the time came 150 years later to form our government, under which we live right now. There are those who tell us that all oh, Christian, Christian biblical principles, Christian principles. What I'd like to do, and listen, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad I live in the United States of America. Please don't. I'm not, a, I'm not advocating the dissolution of our union. I'm so glad to live in the United States. I'm proud to be an American. I thank God. I, I, I have a patriotic spirit when I think about our men and women overseas who are all giving their lives it, it, you know it just it just does something I'm, I'm glad I'm an American I don't want anybody to misunderstand but we need to understand this and I've said this so many times my first citizenship is in heaven I'm a citizen of the United States of America by birth and I, I'm glad I am and I try to do everything I can to be a good citizen including pay my taxes okay. I try to do everything I can okay but my citizenship is in heaven. And the time is coming, and now is, that we're being challenged to determine and decide which, which citizenship are we going to represent in the world that we live in. Now, we're going to look at God's Word in a minute, but I want to just read some things to you. So I hope, I hope you guys don't... It's kind of like a history thing, but... But I don't want to make it too boring. Okay. But listen. I've, read, I've done this before. How many people have actually read the Declaration of Independence? Read it in a book. Read it. Okay. Everybody says Declaration of Independence. And they say, you know. Just let me read the first couple lines from the Declaration of Independence. Okay. And we're going to hold it up to the light of God's word. Okay. In a minute. I'm not going to read the preamble, but it says this. We hold these truths to be self-evident. This was written primarily by Thomas Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. <laughs> with Thomas Jefferson, who was a deist, who did, who did not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. He didn't believe in, in the, 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 the virgin birth. He didn't believe in all that stuff. Uh, he, he believed Jesus was a good teacher and so forth. He says, here's, he says, he believed in a God. So he said, when God created us, he gave us these rights. How many people are, I got my rights? Okay, no. People say these are biblical principles. Let's read it. You have these certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now let's stop there for a minute. I've looked high and low. And, you know, God talks about blessing and, and so forth for obedience. But I cannot find anywhere in the Bible that God promised me or God gave me, says, it's my right to be happy. But it's quiet. It just got quiet. Nowhere. You know, now, now, we wonder why we live in what is called an entitlement we have an entitlement mentality. Our beginnings. We have a right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now, now, this was written by a guy that owned slaves. Only in America, right? Okay. Okay. Now, listen to what he says. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. I want somebody to find that in the Bible for me. The Bible says God sets up and takes down. See, now, I'm, I'm not going to go. They went on and they listed their grievances and so forth and sent it to the king of England and it started the Revolutionary War. But here's what I'm saying. These principles that we're reading here, they're not biblical principles. They're principles that come 
from what is called the Enlightenment. How many have heard that term, the Enlightenment? Or the age of Enlightenment, or the age of reason? The age of reason. Back in the 1600s and the 1700s, there were men, intellectuals, there was a movement to mobilize the power of reason to reform society and advance knowledge. It promoted intellectual interchange and opposed intolerance and abuses in church and state. The American Enlightenment is a term sometimes employed to describe the intellectual culture of the British North American colonies and the early United States as they became known following the American Revolution. It was part of a larger intellectual movement known as the Age of Reason. Influenced by the scientific revolution of the 17th century, the Enlightenment took scientific reasoning and applied it to human nature, society, and religion. Politically, the age is distinguished by an emphasis upon liberty, democracy, republicanism. That doesn't mean republicans, okay. Democracy, republicanism, and religious tolerance, allowing all for all religions. So, and, and, and it goes on. It's these principles upon which our, our nation are found, our government, okay, our government, is founded, are not Christian principles. They're enlightenment principles. This is why... After 200 years of the United States of America, we see things happening. We see our society deteriorating, our culture, our civilization deteriorating. Because the end result of governance without dependence upon God is what we got. If you read the Constitution... There's no mention, really, of, of, of absolute right and wrong that comes from a supreme, transcendent God. Because ultimately, most of them didn't believe in that. They believed in some kind of God. And some of the founding fathers were, I believe, genuine Christians. But the main ones, really, if, if they did, they just pretty much gave a lip service. And that's nothing new. I think every politician we got today claims to be born again Christian. You know what, what happened in, up in New York State? Our president got up, and I'm not going to get political, please. He got up and said, that's good. And I'm, I, people are standing up and applauding all over. Democrat, Republican, I mean, it's not, it's not, and it's not black and white. It's not, you know, left wing, right wing, conservative, liberal. Yep. Governance without God, without an idea that God is in control, Okay. Now I said all that just to kind of set up. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. There's a couple different places. I <clears throat> turn to Exodus. I, and now this is really just kind of a pop. As I said, I was reading this afternoon. And I really was going to talk about something else. I probably should have, but that's okay. Uh, Exodus chapter 14. Now, this is a story we've all heard. We know this story. God uh, had made a way for the, Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. The death angel had come. The Passover, you know, uh, took place. And Pharaoh said, get out. And they started leaving Egypt. Moses led the people of uh, Israel out of Egypt. And they came to the Red Sea, and Pharaoh changed his mind again. So, he came out after him. And the children of Israel, with Moses at their head, there was mountains on the left, mountains on the right, a sea in front of them, and the Egyptian army behind them. Verse 10 of chapter 14 of Exodus. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Do you ever feel that way? God, why would you get me here? 
Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? Well, if you read about it, they were crying out to God a few years before this, that they were under cruel taskmasters, but now that they're up against, you know. You ever say that? Man, I had it better when I was, before I was saved. I had it better out in the world. You know. Okay, that's not the message. Is not this the word that we did tell thee? Okay, uh, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Again, now verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Now Moses was talking by faith here, because God hadn't said nothing to him yet. I mean, uh, Moses had some faith, because here they were up against the sea, and an army behind them, and no place to go. He says, See the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Why for, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Okay, Lord, like there's this, oh, there's a sea here. There's this, there's this water here. I mean, how come we, it's, we're going to get wet? We don't have boats. Okay. He said, go forward, verse 16, but lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thy hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and I, I, sh I shall follow after them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And Egyptians, uh, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh and his chariots. Verse 19. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went, bef went from before their face and stood behind them. Now this is what I'm going to get to. I read all that to get to this picture. Here's the, here's the Israelites and here's the Egyptians. And remember, the Israelites were being led, you know, fire by day, cloud by night, or uh, fire by night, cloud by day, okay? And so here, here we have this cloud coming from in front of the Israelites, coming behind them and becoming a barrier between them and the Egyptians. It says, verse 20, And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and of the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud of darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. So here's what happened. This cloud came from in front of the Israelites to behind the Israelites, between them and the Egyptians. And to the Israelites, it was a bright light, but to the Egyptians... It was darkness. Why do you think there is such a vehement opposition to the gospel? Why do you think? And, and it's getting more and more, it's getting more ramped up. You know, you can talk about God all you want to, but if you start mentioning Jesus, you start mentioning about the God of this Bible that has standards and, and commandments and so forth, a God who says what's right or wrong, th then, then you're, you're being judgmental, you're being a bigot, you're being hateful, you're being a homophobe, you're being... All those labels that they'll put on you, why? Because they see darkness. They see nothing but darkness. To th they can't see the light. Their eyes have been blinded. Because Peter says they willfully reject the knowledge of the truth. It's just a picture. I don't want to preach a message about the Red Sea, but just so you can see this picture, and it's really, it, it's really uh, throughout the Scriptures where the way you see things as a believer is a whole different way. You know, why does this world reject what we have to say? Because they're behind the cloud. They're seeing darkness. Until the Holy Spirit can break that veil off their face, they're not going to understand what you're talking about. They're not going to understand things of, of the Spirit. They can't. They don't have the Holy Spirit. Some folks, sometimes we try to go out and witness to folks and try to give them all kinds of bobs. We need to be careful. We, the only way a, a sinner can see the love of God is on the cross of Jesus, the cross of Calvary. That's the only manifestation of God's love to a lost person. To those who are saved is different. We're of the family, the household of faith and so forth. But to the lost and dying, they don't need to hear, you know, three uh, theories on, you know, the rapture. They don't have a clue. They don't know what you're talking about. 
When we try, when we try to you know, bring all this great deep theological stuff, they need to hear about the cross and what Jesus did on that cross for them. That's the only way they're going to experience God's love. I'm going to look at a couple other passages. And turn with me. Let me get my paper. You know, there's one I don't have written down. I think it's in 1 Corinthians. You have to forgive me. And I said, God, I told you. This was just... Uh, if, if somebody has a good concordance, okay, uh, look up the word savor. S-A-V-O-U in the King James. 2 Corinthians, okay. I knew it was one of them. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I want you to see something. <clears throat> and look at verse... Uh, look at verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. The Apostle Paul writes, Now thanks be unto God, which sometimes causes us to triumph. I find out who many, how many people are keeping up with me. It doesn't say sometimes causes us to triumph. Who always causes us to triumph. Blessed thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Don't leave those words out. and makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Everywhere we go as believers, we bear with us an aroma. Now, I'm not talking about in the natural. Okay. We're talking in the spiritual realm now. We're talking about living in this, in this wicked and perverse generation that has rejected God. Everywhere, if you, if you are born again, if you have the Spirit of God living inside of you, whether you're saved a week or a month or 50 years, there's something about you that causes the people around you to sense a presence. At least there should be. Sometimes we try to mask the aroma. And you know yourself, and I've said this, I've preached on this before. When, when you walk into a house and somebody's cooking a ham, you know it before you get to the door. Come on, you know, what, you know sometimes you know, she'll put stuff in the crock pot on Sunday. You know? And when we get home from church, we're walking up the sidewalk, and I can smell whatever's cooking. Okay. An aroma. Sometimes that's the first thing before you see, before you hear, you can... The Apostle Paul says, he, he, makes, he causes us to triumph and makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Verse 15, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. God, when he sees us and he hears our prayers that go up, Albert talked about praying. And when we pray, that's like a sweet aroma going up into his nostrils. That's what the incense of the Old Testament represented. When they had incense in the temple, in the tabernacle, they, they would, that represented the prayers of the saints. When we cry out to him, even when we're struggling or suffering, when we cry out to him and say, oh God, that's a sweet smelling Aroma. Even if we cry out to him sometimes in, 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 in questioning and say, God, what's going on? Just the fact that we're calling upon him and trusting in him, that's a sweet-smelling savor unto him. And it says not only to him, but to those that are saved and in them that perish. Verse 16. To the one we are a savor of death unto death. When, when we begin to manifest who we are to the world, we remind them of their ultimate destination if they've rejected Jesus Christ. Because I want to tell you something, people might act, might act ignorant toward the gospel, but everybody deep down inside knows that there's a God. 
Everybody deep down inside, they might try to dress them up some other way, but everybody deep down inside knows that there's a God. And when you start, when you start making God real to them in the way you live and act and what you say, in the person of Jesus Christ that dwells inside of us, as I said, everybody can say God. It says God on our money. And God we trust. One nation under God. God bless America. But when you start manifesting the Holy Spirit and Christ, people start getting nervous. Because that means business. That's the light we're going to read about in a minute. That's the light that shows the hole in the pant. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life, and who is sufficient for these? When we get with believers, it's like... We encourage one another, we pray for one another, we give testimonies in, uh, you know, in, to one another, and, we, and we, we lift each other up, we build each other up, we edify the body. But when we get around unbelievers, I've told you some of those stories about when, before I got saved. Some of, you, some of you get sick of hearing them stories, but one time this girl invited me over to her house to like watch TV. I wasn't married then. I said, okay. You know, we'll go watch TV. We went over there. She put the TV on. She's watching Billy Graham. I said, wait a minute. I said, I said, so I don't want to be ignorant. I was watching Billy Graham, yeah, George Beverly Shea singing. It was not a sweet smelling savor to me at that time. It might be now, you know. Why? Because I don't want to hear that stuff. Because I knew they were telling the truth. I knew they were telling the truth. I knew that's where I had to be. But I don't want to go there. Because I had too much other stuff I liked to do. Okay? Sweet smelling savor. So when we get around believers, it's like, oh, hallelujah. Worship God. When, when unbelievers get around us, they're like, oh, I was a Christian. That's why when you put some on YouTube or put some on the internet, people start reading, they start leaving nasty comments. Because you're reminding them about what they know is true. Okay. A couple more. As I said, this is kind of a very loosely put together, so you have to just bear with me. <clears throat> Turn with me over to, to John's Gospel. And these, these are all scriptures that are so... Uh, I guess they're all like that. Chapter 1, the very first chapter. We know it. Some of us can quote it by heart. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. That's pretty clear, isn't it? This, what I was going to preach on tonight was Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, maybe next week. But it says, by faith we believe that God formed everything out of nothing. One of the manifestations of our faith. It says right here, all things were made by Him and without Him was not anything that made that was made. That's clear enough to me. I don't need any scientific... In Him was life, and the life was the what? The light of man. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. We're living in a society filled, in a culture that is filled with such gross, intense darkness. From the top to the bottom. And for decades, people sat in churches and sung their hymns. And the kids went to school and they said the Our Father every day before school. And in God we trust. And the president would come on and say, God, God. And they always, say, they always talk about God. But then I mentioned it Sunday night. Somebody get up and said, why does my kid got to pray in school? I don't want my kid praying in school. Took it to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court read the Constitution and said, I'm going to be praying in school. Can't pray in school no more. I'm not going to do that. The darkness doesn't comprehend it. People sitting on the Supreme Court, they're in darkness. 
maybe some of them are saved. I don't know. I don't know personally. But generally, the people that make all these rules and all these laws, they're, they're in darkness. If they weren't, we wouldn't have some of the laws we got. And they said, well, you know, teaching, I, I mentioned this the other night too, about, you know, what, what, in school we're teaching them about creation and, and, and then there's evolution. And evolution came and they finally came out. At, at first, it was illegal to teach evolution in school, you know, 80, 90 years ago. And it got finally, now to the point now, it's turned around where you can't say nothing about God. Evolution is the accepted dogma. They teach the religion of evolution. It's religion because you have to have faith to believe in it. Can't say anything about God. Downhill, downhill, downhill. And none of the founding documents say anything to, to prevent. Because when they, when they wrote them, they didn't care about the gospel. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness doesn't understand. In verse, look, look at verse, uh, no, we'll keep reading. Then the man was sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of that light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, John the Baptist was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That the true light, which lights every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, thank God, for as many as had heard his message, for as many as had saw the light and allowed God to show them everything about themselves that was ugly and things that they, they had to repent of and things they had to bring to the cross, for all the, who would receive what, that, that light that was showing them themselves in the light of the gospel, for all them that received him, he gave power to become the sons and daughters of God, even to them that believe on His name. You can practice any religion you want to, and they'll let you go. But you start saying about Jesus, and they'll call you every name in the book. Should it be any different today than it was 2,000 years ago? Jesus said, over in the end of John, John, he says, if they hated me, are they going to love you? See, we've been, we've been living in a dream world in this, in this culture, in this society. Everything was, you know, oh, go to church, sing hymns, you know, you know, come home and whatever. Stores didn't open up on Sunday. How many people can remember that? Everything was closed on Sunday. Blue laws, they call them. I don't know why they call them blue laws. Blue laws. I mean, when I was a kid, you didn't do nothing on Sunday. Now, you do you know, soccer, softball, ain't doing everything. It's just, why? Because darkness doesn't comprehend it. We took it for granted. Well, we're a Christian nation. We took it for granted. But now we're faced with the reality that this culture and society we live in really doesn't want to hear about Jesus Christ. They don't. They're darkness. Darkness hates the light. Darkness loves to be dark. You remember when you were in darkness? Let's read something else. Let's turn here. And I'm not going to keep you too much longer. I promise. Say, so, yeah, you always say that. Okay. <laughs> Liar. Okay. I'm not... This is one of the ones I'm just kind of flying by the seat of my pants here. I got, I got rid of the brown ones. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. <laughs> They're gone. Okay. All right. Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 17. Now, you know, Ephesians chapter 4, the beginning of that chapter is, our, is kind of like our motto, building the body of Christ, edifying the body, and so forth. You read about the, the fivefold ministry gifts and the things that go on. But look at verse 17. Paul, the Apostle Paul is writing this to the church at Ephesus. And he says, This I, I therefore and testify in the Lord. Uh, and, and the church at Ephesus was primarily Gentiles. It, it wasn't, some churches had mostly Jews and, you know, and converted Jews, but these were Gentiles. And we talked about Ephesus, how when they got saved, they burned all their magic books and so forth. Okay. 
This I, I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Listen to what he's talking. This is, this is where we were. If you're a believer. If you're not a believer, then you're still here. This is where we were. I had, my heart was blind. I walked in the vanity of my own mind. One of the comments I got on that video, if you go to YouTube, you can see there's comments posted. The person said to me, he says, uh, or he or she, I'm not sure who it was. He said, uh, I, I had, I, talked in there about the Bible, the Word of God. And this person said, well, Jesus is bigger than that book. And I wrote back and I said, we can't know about him if it's not for this. See, what people like to do is they like to make a Jesus of their own creation. You ever do that? They like to fashion Christ... In just the way they could have them, just like the golden calf, just like they did in Exodus, when they made that golden calf, they said, and they call them, they call them Yahweh, they call them, they give them the right name. We'd like to make a Jesus, and I've done it, I've done it really a few times since I've been saved. I've just confessed to you, and I've had to repent. But before we're saved, people that don't know the Lord, people that are in darkness, they'll just make God whoever they want Him to be. They'll say, "Here's a God I believe in. Well, I believe Him, so that must be the way God is. Just you know, I believe in God." So we'll just, we'll just make God, we create God in our own image. Instead of reading about the God that created us in His image, we don't want Him. Because he, he expects things of us. If we create God in our own image, well, we can just make God, you know, do what we want Him. You know, dang, like a little puppet. <laughs> I lived in the vanity of my own mind. I had my own ideas about what I believed about God and all this other stuff. They were all pretty stupid, too. My understanding was darkened. I was alienated from the life of God through ignorance because my heart was blind. Verse 19, I was past feeling. Everything I did was, was centered upon me and no one else. Everything I did as a non-believer, everything I did before I received the light, when I was in darkness, the, the most important person in this universe was me. And I wasn't going to mess with nobody or deal with anybody or any kind of God that was going to do anything that was going to go against what I wanted. And you could put your name in there. I'm talking about me. But if you're like me, and I think most of you were. Being past feeling, verse 19, giving them over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. That lasciviousness, that's, that's wanton lust. Just whatever feels good. And that's what's happening. You know, it used to be in our society, we had a society and a culture with, with morals that said, this was, this was wrong, this is right. So that's why if a person started to feel inordinate sexual uh, attraction, they would go to the moral and say, well, this is wrong. And they said, well, that's wrong. Because society says it's wrong. Now, society says, hey, there's nothing wrong. So if it feels good to you, good for you. Go do it. That's where we're at. That's why, as believers, we need to be so focused and so determined that I am not going to be shaken from what this word tells me. Because the, the rest of the world tells me, this is okay, that's okay, that's all right, this is, you know, later, that's an old book, and everything's new now. I have to continue to stand on what this Word says. It doesn't mean I'm going to hate anybody. It doesn't mean I'm going to look down my nose. Some folks, they take it to an extreme, and they think they're better than everybody. I, we can't think we're better than anybody else. We're just saved. We used to be there. But God wants us. To be, again, going back to that light and darkness, He wants us to be a light in the middle of this darkness. 
And you know what? Some people will be drawn to the light and some people will reject the light. But we need to be the light of Christ. Uh, oh, we can read the rest of this. But you have not so learned Christ in verse 20. Let's just read this. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, if you have been exposed to the light that you put off, okay, here's how we're going to shine the light. And we'll close. We'll close this. That you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to this deceitful lust. That means as believers, even we're saved on the inside, we need to do some work on the outside. Because you know something I found out? I got saved on the inside. And I knew I was saved, and I knew I was made whole, and I knew I had the Holy Ghost. But there were some things on the outside I had to deal with. <laughs> That's just, and I'll be honest with you, there's a few things on the outside I'm still dealing with. And I'll probably deal with until I go to be with Him. See, I, I, I tell folks, I always, I always get concerned. If somebody tells me they get saved, and they're like, snap, man, and they're like, super saint. You know? When they tell me that, I say, oh. I don't say nothing, but I'm thinking, yeah, give them about two weeks and over. All right. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Okay. Now, just reading. We'll close with this. You put off concerning the former conversation or lifestyle, the old man, which is corrupt according to its deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The Bible says, we're renewed in the spirit of, of our mind by the washing of the water of the word what we're doing right now, reading and preaching and teaching God's Word. And that you put on the new man, you take the old one off, put the new one on, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, wherefore putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are all members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Oh God, help me. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither, neither give place to the devil. See, see, he's warning us about this because it, it lets me know that we're capable of letting this happen. Don't you know Satan wants to, wants, to, wants to darken us? He wants to put a veil over us so the world out there doesn't see the light? Satan hates our light. Satan hates it when you show your light. You know, you could, if you dig yourself a hole somewhere, you, he'll let you be a Christian all you want to, just hide, hide in your little house. But you start taking that thing outside, man, and you'll get all kinds of... Okay. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, a thing which is good that he may have to give him uh, that needs. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Oh, God help us. But that which is good to the use of edifying, which everything we say ought to be to build somebody up and not tear him down. And I'm just, I'll tell you what. The old James says, this little tongue, start a big fire. Whew. Okay. We need to watch. I need to watch what I say. I was talking to somebody. I forget who it was. We were talking about ministry. And I've learned that when you're standing up here, there's just some things you don't want to say. You might say something that you think is cute, and somebody might not think it's very cute at all. You've got to watch. <laughs> okay. All right. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of reception, uh, redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Why? Because that's what shows the light. That's what dispels the darkness. God wants us to be light bearers. His light bearers. In the middle of a wicked and perverse generation. Listen. I thank God I live in the United States of America. I, there are about three or four more I could read, but I'm not going to. We'll just leave it there. I thank God I live in this United States of America, but you know what? I don't have, I'll be honest with you, I don't have hope for it. I pray for it. We're never told that we're, we're told to pray for those in leadership, kings and leaders and so forth. I pray for the government. Pray for our president. Pray for our Congress, the Supreme Court. Pray for our armed forces. I mean, we, we pray for, you know, the police and all this other. We pray. We need to pray for them. We need to pray for their salvation. We need to pray that the people that see the light... You know, we were in Harrisburg for our camp meeting. 
and we happen to just have the news on, their local news. <laughs> and they had the shootings and the house, you know, the same around here. But we found out that Harrisburg has a, a, a woman mayor who is saved. She's a Christian. And she fasts and prays. And she prays before when they have like a meeting. And she, she tells her, her, the people that work for her, well, I'll be praying for you. And don't you know they want to throw her out? Don't you not? Now, I don't know. I'm, I don't live there, so I don't know the whole story. But we, just watching the stories that were on their home roads, we, we, we were watching. Yeah, there, there were people saying, well, she shouldn't be there, you know, church and state and all this other stuff. I mean, she's just, she's just trying to show her light. I don't know how she got elected. Praise God. I should have her move here to New Kensington and get elected. But, but the thing is, they, they want to throw her out. Because she's showing the light of Christ. If they hated Jesus, why are they going to love her? If they hated Jesus, they're, they're not going to name a government office building after you. You know, <laughs> if you go to Washington, D.C., and you go to all the office buildings, you can look, I'm, I'm honest to goodness, I'm done. And you look, and you see all these, like, gargoyles and, you know, like, and the bearded, you know, whoever they are. You don't see one Jesus nowhere. You don't see any crosses anywhere. You see, in the Capitol building, there's the god Mars, the god of war, there's the goddess of peace. You don't see Jesus anywhere. How come? Because they don't want them. I thank God. I live in the United States of America. But I'm looking for Jesus to come back. <laughs> God, even so, come quickly. Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Anybody have any questions or comments? We're going to close. I'm kind of kept you longer than, sorry if I rambled a little bit tonight. But, uh, okay. Yes, Miss Jane. Yes, he did. Thomas Paine. He was, a, he was a, Thomas Paine, and he's one of the guys that's in the video we're going to look at Tuesday night, but he, uh, he wrote uh, uh, Common Sense. Was, 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 that was like the, that was like the, uh, the, the, the pamphlet that, that started the Revolutionary War. He also wrote a book called The Age of Reason. Some people say he was an atheist. He wasn't. He was a deist. He believed in God, but he hated the gospel. He hated Christianity. He believed that there was a being out there, but he hated Christianity. He was an enlightenment thinker. An enlightenment. See, they have, a, they have a light, but it's not God's light. Satan, as a matter of fact, Paul says Satan will send his ministers as an angel of light. You better watch out what light you're looking at. <laughs> Make sure it's the light of the gospel. Anybody else have any comments or questions at all before I close? Okay, you all ain't mad at me, all right? Okay. Some, some folks, some folks get mad. When you start messing with, you know, there's some folks, they, they make a whole ministry out of saying about what a great Christian, you know, Christian meant. Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? Be the light that God wants you to be. Why don't you stand with me? We'll close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word.